And what basically ended up happening is a, uh, we released a, uh, a kind of patch to the Ethereum blockchain that would make a uh, kind of one-time edit in, uh, of the uh, Ethereum's, uh, Ethereum's uh, kind of account state, and it moved the Ether over from the DAO, and the attacker would have been able to uh, get hold of the money five days later into basically a refund contract so that everyone could get their money back. And this is viewed as uh, controversial because it, uh, it, it, it does sort of interfere with the uh, execution of the code exactly, exactly as written. And a lot of people believe that this, uh, that what they call kind of immutability or that sort of code as a law is one of these uh, important blockchain principles. Um, so to that point, I guess I would argue that I mean, first of all, the claim that uh, blockchains are infinitely immutable is ridiculous because, uh, look, the fact is, if you have $40 million, you can 51% attack Ethereum, and if you have about $200 million, you can 51% attack Bitcoin, and you can reverse as many transactions as you want. Um, so, you have to be a bit realistic about the limitations of these systems as they stand today. And the second thing is that I think that even though the system, like, the immutability by itself is pretty worthless if all that's immu all, all that you're making immutable is loving's running off a cliff. Like, if you, if, uh, I feel like in order for principles to be valuable, they have to serve like some kind of social purpose. And we're, you know, obviously, immutability does have value, but I feel like in order for it to, like, in order for something like that to actually make sense. There, I think we've clearly realized that there needs to be a lot more supporting infrastructure in terms of reducing the risk of these kinds of faults and coming up with ways of resolving these faults without going down into the base layer. So in the summer of 2016, you know, realistically, you know, these technologies don't exist. And the, uh, but the, one of the things that really uh, made, um, increased my confidence in the community is that like, Within like one one or two months after the hack of the fork took place, there's now about five teams at least working on various kinds of automated verification tools, various kinds of fault recovery tools, like all sorts of higher level infrastructure that would make uh, these kinds of um, of mistakes uh, less likely to happen to happen in the future. And I mean, I think it's in general important to view Ethereum and it's like really all these blockchain systems as systems that are still very early in, the, in their development. And, you know, I openly say, the fact is, you know, Ethereum is not ready for a lot of mainstream applications because for me, I mean, at the very least for mainstream applications, you want 50,000, 100,000 transactions a second, and Ethereum, you know, can do 15. So, like, I think from a lot of standpoints, whether it's scalability, whether it's privacy, whether it's security, there still is a, 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 quite a bit of a way to go. And over time, uh, obviously, the platform can uh, will hopefully come closer and closer to a state that we can all, all be satisfied with. But I think until then, it should be viewed as uh, as a living ecosystem and not so much as kind of a fixed work of art. Okay, I, I want to just then come back to that um, because I think it's quite critical about going forward. But before we do that, just to be clear, it wasn't Ethereum that was hacked. It was this entity that was using theory. And lots of people have been confused about that. They think, well, this shows that blockchains aren't secure. And uh, that's just 